this, and I just praise God for he, how he is at work. And I will tell you that, you know, that group is really focused on studying the word and discipling one another and caring for one another. And there's been several people who have come to know Jesus as a result of the ministry uh, through that group in the past few years. And really, that's a picture of what all of our groups should look like, that we really see a, a belonging and we see a teaching and we see a desire to reach uh, people for Christ. And I pray that we would all take uh, that challenge and, and, and say, how can we do that uh, better in our groups? I think we had a taste of that in our Christ-centered marriage conference. Um, I even was told by someone who used to be a part of this church who was here, how they really saw Titus 2 lived out in the uh, couples who are more seasoned in their life, teaching the younger couples about uh, marriage and even some parenting and how, how beautiful that was. And so I want to say thank you again to everyone who participated, but especially to those who led. And I'm so thankful that we were able to have Bland Mason with us last week uh, and for the wonderful job he did teaching on how our marriage on this earth can get caught up in something that is even bigger than our marriage. And the placement of his sermon on marriage was not random. But it was intentional. He taught last week on a Christ-centered marriage right in the middle of our study of Hosea. Now, typically, I, I like to spend a few weeks every year around this time of the year uh, to focus on marriage and do a marriage series. And so you might think, well, why did not we not you know, teach on marriage uh, this time of the year? But uh, we are. The story of Hosea and Gomer, the story of God and Israel, the story of God and us is really the pattern for the way that we should love our spouse. God uses the example of Hosea's love for Gomer to show us that he says, I love you. And even though I don't deserve it, or even though, excuse me, you don't deserve it, I'm here and I am not going anywhere. And what a pattern that sets for us as those who would love our spouses. We'll pick up in chapter eight today in Hosea. In the first seven chapters, we've seen a lot of ways that Israel and ultimately we forget who God is because we've been deceived by our desires, believing that they can be met in a way uh, apart from trusting in him. And so uh, Hosea chapter 8 verse 1 uh, through 9, 9 will be our text today. Before we read that, uh, let me pray for our time in the word. God, I pray that we would have open ears and open hearts to what you would have to say to us today. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, empty me and, and, and just speak through me. And God, I just pray that you would increase that you would get all glory uh, from our time together in your word. God, thank you for the power of your word that we see on display. And I just pray that everyone would know and believe that that can be a reality in their life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's read Hosea chapter 8, verse 1 through 9, 9. Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. To me they cry, my God, we Israel know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue him. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel, a craftsman made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. For they sow the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no flower. If it were to yield, strangers would devour it. Israel is swallowed up. Already they are among the nations as a useless vessel. For they have gone to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up, and the king and princes shall soon ride because of the tribute. Because Ephraim has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. Were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as a strange thing. As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. Chapter 9. Rejoice not, O Israel. Exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. They shall not pour drink offerings of the wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please him. 
It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for the hunger, their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God, yet a fowler's snare is on all his ways and hatred in the house of God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their sins. Excuse me. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. There's some days when we're going through this, and I'm thinking, we are the only church in all of America who's going through these texts. Um, Chapter 8, verse 1 says, God tells Amos to set the trumpet to your lips, which means to proclaim loudly the word of the Lord to his people. He says, one like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. That word vulture uh, could also be translated eagle. It literally means large bird of prey, and it would symbolize that judgment was coming upon a a dying people. And so judgment is coming. He says in verse 5, I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? And then in verse 6, he says, For it is from Israel, a craftsman made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. Now, you need to understand what had happened in the northern kingdom. You have in this day two kingdoms, a southern kingdom, which is Judah, which really is right around the area of Jerusalem, which had been the center of Israel. And then the northern kingdom is uh, the, the land beyond that. And uh, in the northern kingdom, they had set up temples, which were not the temple. And they really weren't supposed to do this, but the reason they did this is because the king didn't want his people going to Jerusalem to worship out of fear that he might lose um, you know, some power because the people wanted to go to the temple to worship. So they set up these faux temples, if you will, and in those temples, they allow the idolatry of the regions around them to creep into their worship. And so in many of the temples, there was an image of God on top of a bull, and this was what they worshipped. Now, this should not have ever happened in the first place because of the commandments and the instructions they were given. But what was then happening is the attention, the direction of the people was not the God on top of the bull, but the bull because the bull was more practical. The bull symbolized agricultural success and economic success. And so this became a part of how they worshipped and a part of how they lived, therefore. And God says, how long will you be incapable of innocence? Meaning, how long will you not deal with the sin that's in your heart and remain guilty before me? And, you know, they had been warned against this in Deuteronomy chapter 4. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, as they're coming out of Egypt, wandering through the wilderness, preparing to be in the place that God had promised their forefather Abraham long ago, God says to them in in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 4, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. Lest you forget how I miraculously delivered you out of slavery, out of bondage in Egypt, how I provided for you in the wilderness. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, make them known to your children and your children's Children, how God saved you needs to be a part of your life and it needs to be a part of what you teach your children and your children's children. He told them, take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. So they had gotten to this place of prosperity and they had forgotten. But what's interesting to note is this is not a godless nation. This is not a godless people. They knew this stuff. They even still studied this stuff. It was still a part of their culture. James Montgomery Boyce says this, the problem is not forgetting God intellectually. It is forgetting God morally. The problem is not forgetting God intellectually. It is forgetting God morally. And I want to look at four ways that this text shows us that we can know God intellectually and forget God morally. So four ways that we know God intellectually and forget God morally. Before I do that, let me explain 
or clarify what I mean by knowing God intellectually and forgetting God morally because we carry different definitions of those words and so I want to make sure you know what I'm trying to say. So when I talk about knowing God intellectually, I mean this, that we are aware that there is a God, we are likely aware that there is one God and we can give the right answers about that God, that God comes first, that with God all things are possible, that you need God, that I need God. We, we know that. Forgetting God morally means he's not driving us, and therefore he's not shaping the way that we live our lives. So four ways that we know God intellectually and forget God morally. The first is our leaders, our leaders. We want things to go a certain way in our lives. Ultimately, you and I want freedom, opportunity, prosperity, security. Those are not bad things. In fact, for the Christian, we should want those things for the glory of God. We should want the freedom to live for God. We should want to have opportunities to do things for the glory of God. We should want prosperity so that we would have more influence for God, and ultimately, we should want security, keeping those things intact. And we know that God uses leaders in our lives to usher those things in, to uh, preserve those things. But what happens if we're not careful is we begin to look for the wrong kind of leaders. And we see this happening in, the, in Israel. Look at chapter 8, verse 4. It says, they set up kings but not through me. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. And so, you know, what's happening here is they are appointing these leaders, but they're not the leaders that God wants for them. Now, their leaders were both spiritual and political. The, 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 if you are a king in Israel, it carried a spiritual a connotation from God's word. And for us, that's not necessarily true. We have political leaders and spiritual leaders, and those don't have to be the same thing. And so let's first talk about political leaders. So again, we want freedom. We want prosperity. We want opportunity. We want security. We might have different definitions of those things, but we want those things. And those are not a bad thing. But those things cannot be elevated over our love for God. And that is what had happened in the nation of Israel. These leaders seemed to be able to give them something, and so they begin to put the wrong leaders over them. Look in verse 9 and 10, what it says. It says, For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up, and the kings and princes shall soon ride because of the tribute. Again, they want freedom. They want prosperity. They want opportunity. They want security. And they believed that these nations that were not living the way God intended for them to live promised them a better opportunity for those things. And so they began to align themselves with that way. This is why today we have people who have a displaced passion for politics. We have Christians in the church, not just this church, but probably in this church, who are more passionate about who would be in the Oval Office than the fact that Jesus is sitting on the throne. We have people who are more consumed with what is happening in politics than what God's word says about how we should be living our lives. And so there becomes this displaced passion for these things. There becomes an excusal of some, some significant things for a main objective that we might obtain, that we might want in our lives. And there becomes an ignoring of truth because we want something out of our political leaders. And my plea to you would be this, that your identity is found not in a politician in an office, but in a king who reigns over a kingdom. And that you are first and foremost a son and daughter of God as a citizen of God who's been called to live and pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's not just political leaders. It's spiritual leaders too. We know that we look to God. And we look to spiritual leaders 
to help us with that. And we look to spiritual leaders to help us look at ourselves and to help us look to the world. And in light of who God is, in light of who we are, in light of what our world is like, to be obedient to God. Spiritual leaders teach us. They help us to understand things. They're gifted to do that. Spiritual leaders are able to give us direction corporately as a church and maybe even individually in our lives for how we could do what God's called us to do. Spiritual leaders are able to help us with application. What do we do with this? How do we apply this to our lives in which we've learned? And and spiritual leaders help us with encouragement. But if we have these things, good teaching, mm, and I did that mm again. I did that first service too. I don't know why I do that, but that's what you do. You have good teaching and good direction and good application if we have these things, but we can forget the heart of God. And so what that results in is that results in an attraction to maybe prosperity teaching. You know, where we say God just wants what we want for us all the time. And so how can God give me more of what I want? Or an attraction to popular teaching. How can I live my life in a way that the most people as possible like me? Or, or an attraction to maybe just certain aspects of the faith that we seem to particularly, based on our personality, have an interest in at neglect of other things that are important to God. And what happens is we forget God morally. We know we should be living God, but it's really for God, but it's not really God who's shaping us and guiding us and directing us. And so what we do here is we find a teacher who gives us, or a leader who gives us enough of God so that we can actually avoid God. We find somebody who helps us to feel justified for the way that we live, but we actually don't have to surrender to everything in our lives. Now, here's something that we need to take note of, because it's very easy to look at political leaders and spiritual leaders and and talk about how bad they are. But our leaders are typically a reflection of our values. Our leaders are typically a reflection of our values. Speaking purely hypothetical here, but not at all. If we, if we have a lot of leaders who have poor character but value economic prosperity, that's because we have a lot of people who have poor character but value economic prosperity in our country. If we have leaders who kind of, you know, follow these political ideals without a real valuing of, you know, morality and life and some of the innocent, then that's because, listen, we have a lot of people who think that way. If we have spiritual leaders who have a big following or lots of spiritual leaders believing that God is this like cosmic sugar daddy, it's because there's a lot of people who believe that. If we have a lot of teachers who kind of think we should redefine love and the parts of the Bible we don't like about God, we'll just redefine because we're really in charge of that, it's because there's a lot of people who believe that. And so the reality here is these leaders rise to positions they're in as a reflection of the values of people. Hitler promised Germany economic prosperity and stability that they had not had, and they compromised a lot because of what he and his party had to offer. In the times of slavery, there were spiritual leaders who were twisting the truth of Scripture so that we could justify a devaluing of human beings. And we see this trend happen over and over again. So what do we do about that? I'm going to talk about that when we wrap up. Let's move on to number two. Another way that we forget God morally, but we know him intellectually, is our worship. This sort of connected to spiritual leaders, so we don't have to spend a ton of time here, but we know that we should worship. And we even articulate that we should worship God. But we tend to forget God as the driver of our worship. Look at what verse 11 says about Ephraim, which is a part of Israel. They multiplied altars for sinning, so they have become to him altars for sinning. They're building more altars. The religion in the nation is spreading. And yet, there are altars for sinning. And so that means more sinning. God says in verse 13 in chapter 8, As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. 
Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. God says, I see you sacrificing. And I see your heart. And I know who you are. And I don't accept your sacrifice. Worship, the Psalms tell us through David mostly, is of the heart. It's about our heart before God. Now listen, don't miss this. Because we often do not define worship as a heart surrendered to God. We tend to think of worship being valuable based on its style. There's a group of people who, you know, for a long time have have really believed that they feel connected to God if they burn candles and they burn incense. And so that makes them feel good. But then, you know, on the other hand, my generation, and Jared Wilson points this out in one of his books, says, well, that's really religious, but we have to have fog machines and laser lights. (laughs) Or we can't worship. On the other hand, so we're, we're picking on somebody else here now, there's people who say, if I don't have hymns and an organ in the sanctuary doesn't look like it was from 1950s, then I can't worship. And we're defining our worship based on an era, not based on the cross. And so what we're doing here, and, and you can put anything into this. I can't be a part of a church if they don't have this programming or, you know, if the building doesn't look like this or they don't have buildings. It's so funny because we're thinking about planting a church in Freeport and God's really working that out. And several people have asked me, well, where's the church going to be? And I'm like, in Freeport? And they're like, no, where's it going to be? And I'm like, wherever they all live and work and what, what do you mean? Oh, where the building is going to be. Because you can worship in a school. You can worship in a backyard as a body of believers. And so, you know, all across our world, people are not worshiping in nice buildings like this. And we have to be careful that we begin to define our worship based on a style or a feeling that we get from worship. Worship, David said, is of a broken and contrite heart. I want you to listen to this. Because often when people talk about what worship is, they talk about how it lifted them up and built them up. But in worship, we die to ourselves, we sacrifice ourselves, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and God builds us up. And there is something, there is something about when worship is not defined by a style or a place, but by God's just meeting you where you are. And that's what we should be holding on to as worshipers. But look at what happens in verse 14 here. It says, For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. You see, they're building and building and building as the people of God, and more altars are being built. And and, and he's saying the more altars and the more you grow, the more it just means sin. And we need to take heed to that when it comes to economic prosperity and also when it comes to the prosperity and growth of, of, of our church, of, of a church. We desire to grow, listen, as a church, because we believe the more people we have, the more people, you know, that, that could mean we're reaching for the kingdom of God. We want to plant more churches ultimately because we value multiplication and it's going to mean more people. But we have to be people who are focused on Jesus, Because if we grow and multiply churches who are full of people who know God intellectually but forget him morally, it just means more people who know God intellectually but forget him morally. And so it's about making disciples. We cannot, listen, we cannot feel good about our walk with God because the church itself is growing. We need to be taking a look at ourselves and saying, are we doing what God has called us to do? We want to see that multiply. That's what we want to see. This I can't tell you how I got into this conversation because you might know who and context of which I'm talking about. But this a couple weeks ago, I was uh, there was a guy I was talking to, and um, he's a leader in another church in this area and uh, really involved there. And we got into this conversation, and he finally said, "Well, I just really don't care about doctrine. I'm just following Jesus." And like that sounds good. And, you know, I mean, I might say that, you know, if somebody's like, why don't you fight with, you know, other preachers? Or like, I don't mean like fist fight, but like, why don't you, because um, uh, I'm big, so I would hold my own with most of them. But why don't, uh, why don't you get into doctrinal fights, you know, with preachers or whatever it may be about whatever. And I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm too busy really following Jesus and trying to do what God's called us to do. Like, I get that. But, but that's actually a pretty dangerous statement because, and I, I said, maybe we'll talk about that another time, which we won't. But, you know, 
Like, how do you know you're following Jesus, man? And if you're following Jesus, shouldn't that lead to some beliefs about the world and some beliefs about certain things? And ultimately, like, what if Jesus disagrees with how you think? Who, are you going to keep following him? And so we, we have to be sure here that when we talk about our worship, we're really saying, hey, Jesus is, Jesus is the one I'm living for. And I want to see more people connected to that. I'll talk about what we do about this at the end. Let me kind of transition number three, the third way that we forget God intellectually, or forget God morally and know God intellectually is his word. We should be in the word, and, and we can be in the word and forget God. Let me, let me show you three indicators of knowing the word intellectually but not morally. And, and I would say this is almost a progression. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1 says, Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Look, they know the word, but they don't obey the word. That would be the first indicator. You don't obey the word. God made a covenant with them. He said, trust me and I will bless you. I mean, it's, it's an amazing covenant because he's telling them, they're like Gomer, they're not faithful, but he'll be faithful to them. Just trust me, and I'll, I'll bless you. And so back to this definition of, you know, what it means to forget God morally, when we're not obeying God's word, we're not, he's not shaping us. And so we just kind of do otherwise. Like, what this is like is it's like James says it this way in the, in the book of James. It's being, being a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word is like a man who looks in the mirror and walks away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So that would be like, so me, for example, you know, I, I, I work out a good bit, um, but um, I'm not seeing the results that I should get because I eat pizza a good bit as well. And uh, the truth is, you know, I often think, man, I would be in really good shape if I would just stop eating pizza. Um, and so I look in the mirror and I'm like, I would be in good shape if I'd stop eating pizza, but I walk away and I kind of forget that because pizza smells good. Now, the point of this is not for you to come and tell me I shouldn't eat pizza because I will meet that with 100% defensiveness. Um, the point of this is that the reason why that is I just don't care enough. This is truthful. I don't care enough to not eat pizza. <laughs> and the reason why you hear the word and don't do the word is you just don't love God enough. You just don't care enough to do what he says. Look at verse 12. It says, were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as a strange thing. I would give him more and more law and more and more what to do and how to do it. But it would just be considered strange by him. See, the church doesn't need a bunch of more Bible studies. A lot of our church, we're in three Bible studies at this building and three Bible studies other places, and yet there are major things of God that we're missing on. And this, this could be an indicator here. Another indicator that you're forgetting the word morally is maybe the more you read, the farther you are from Christ's likeness. I'm not saying that's everybody, but Francis Chan says it's a terrifying reality that you could actually read the Bible and end up farther away from God. Now, you know that I value Scripture. I mean, again, we're reading a section of Hosea because we said we go through Hosea that I don't know if that, you know, everyone, <laughs> very many people are going through. But... Um, just because we read the Bible doesn't mean we're being who God wants us to be. I mean, a great example of that is the Pharisees. The Pharisees were these people who used the word to justify themselves. And so you end up finding people who end up being very legalistic. Why? Because if you take a prideful person and bring them to church, they just become a prideful church person. And then you find people who, you know, I, their pride is just kind of abusing the text and a, a more liberalistic view to the word and freedom to the word. And we define love. We define these concepts instead of letting God define them. People miss ba big aspects, simple aspects of the faith, but can know a lot about the Bible. Why? Because of this. Because they want to be justified by God, so they're in the book. But they're not trying to know God. They know God intellectually, but he's not driving them. And in verse, chapter 9, verse 7 through 9, he says, The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. 
The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God, yet a fowler's snare is on all his ways, and hatred in the house of God. They have deeply corrupted themselves in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. He's saying they don't want to hear from God, and so they're not listening to prophets. They're not listening to spiritual people. And I would say that's the third indicator, and probably the final indicator is you prefer teaching and advice that is not rooted in the Bible. You begin to find yourself attracted to teaching that isn't centered on actually the character of God. And you go from reading and not doing to diving into how you can live your life, avoiding some aspects of what it means to follow God. And we just live in this state where there's a, there's a church, not in the state of Florida, but you know, probably in the state of Florida, but this, this time in our nation where, and because of the internet too, like the, you can find any genre of church you want to find that kind of meets your niche of who you think you are. But we don't define our faith by who we think we are. We define our faith by an increasing knowledge of who God is. That's what's shaping us. And so as we get to point four, we'll begin to answer the question of what do we do? And the fourth way that we know God intellectually but forget God morally is our joy. Our joy. We want joy. Use whatever word you want to use there. Happiness, joy, peace. We want it. And we believe God can give us joy, but look, look at what's going on here, what God says to them in chapter 9, verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel. Exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. He's saying... You should, you're coming for joy, and you should not have joy. And you will not get these, this grain, and you will not get this new wine, which if you're a gluten-free independent Baptist has no significance to you whatsoever. But the point here is these are things that represent blessing, and, and you're not going to get them. And so he says you should not rejoice. Verse 4, they shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifice shall not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? He's saying the bread you're going to eat now is just mourner's bread. There's no reason to have joy. You're not going to have an abundance of bread anymore. You're going to only eat to meet your hunger. And on the harvest festival of Succoth, the day of feast, there's nothing to rejoice in. So God is saying you are going to be caused to stop and see your emptiness. But listen, God's saying they're empty, but they're super religious. They're people of faith. They're people who know God and say the right things about God, but yet there's something missing. And it shows in the way that they're living their lives. They're consuming. It's all about them. It's all about what they want. And and I've noticed, and I think you'll admit, no, you'll recognize this too. If you live to make yourself glad, you will strangely find yourself with an increasing desire to make yourself glad. If you live to make yourself glad, if that's the, that's the summary of your existence, then you will strangely find yourself with an increasing desire to make yourself glad because it's not enough. And, and that is where some of you are here. You know, something I've noticed in a, in a day where we're fed self-care and me time is the people who have the most me time typically feel like they need the most me time still. You know, like, the people who take the most vacations are all the, always the ones post on Facebook, like, I need another vacation. And look, vacations are part of my secondary, um, my secondary convictions. I have primary convic convictions, which come from the Bible, and, and then I have secondary convictions, like men don't celebrate birthdays that don't end in zero. You should know that by now. And um, men don't take to-go boxes, which is part of my pizza problem. And then... Uh, we should take vacations with our family because it's, it's, it's just beneficial. But what I've noticed is the people who that's like what they're living for, they're just so empty and they're miserable. And, you know, we live in this day where these families are just driven by all these opportunities they can have. And we got to do this. We got to give ourselves this opportunity. Got to give my kids this opportunity. And they're just miserable. And it's because their summary of their existence is what might make us glad. And here's what's happening there's a bull 
with the image of God on it, and they're worshiping the bull because it's more practical, and that's affecting the way that they live their lives. So what do you do? Well, here's what I would say. If you begin to really press into one of these areas I've talked about, with God in the position of God, God is so big that he will begin to flow into the other areas. So if, if you begin to look at, look for leaders who truly their eyes are on Jesus Christ, it will begin to change the way you view your joy. It will begin to change the way you view worship. It will begin to change the way you spend time in the word. If, if you come to worship and you just come to worship saying, God, I empty myself, I want more of you, God will begin to then let that flow into the time of the word and, and you'll begin to look for leaders who, who want to point you towards Jesus and there will begin to be a joy that truly comes from him. If you are in the word with the idea of God, you shape me, then it will begin to change worship. It'll begin to point you to teachers and that help you in letting God shape you and it'll begin to change your joy. And if you truly are in a place where you say, God, I know that you alone can give me joy. He'll begin to show you that in the way of teachers, in the way of or leaders, excuse me, and in the way of the word and in the way of worship. And it will begin to affect the way you live your life. John Piper says this, if you live gladly to make others glad in God, your life will be hard, your risk will be high, and your joy will be full. Because all these things begin to point us to this completeness that we have in God, this wholeness that we have in God, the shalom peace that we have in God. And it begins to help us to see the reality of heaven. And it urges us, it overflows in us to live our lives in thi on this earth for the reality of heaven. Le leave, leave, leave those verses on the screen, I mean that, that quote on the screen. A couple of weeks ago at our new members class, at our join class, I was asked, and there was, I think, some things that prompted this, but, hey, do you require parents to serve in kids or student ministry with their kids? And I said, I'm not going to make anybody do anything. I can't make anybody do anything. I mean, I live at home with a wife and six children in my house. I can't make them do some things. But here's what I would tell you. And when I call you and I urge you, parents, be involved in children's and student ministry. Everybody serve. Here, here's what's driving me. God through what I see in people's lives. Many of you know Tom and Mary Wright who are in our first service. And they have committed their lives to serving people for decades. And they have such joy. And Roger and Kay Barrett, who still are actively involved in serving in different areas of ministry and beyond. And they raise these godly children. And they just, their love overflows to everybody they meet. Dan Hinkle, who's our chairman of deacons, he's a, he's a city leader, is a servant still and has been a servant he and his wife for years Leah Brown whose husband was the worship pastor of this church and died suddenly and who has just continued to serve the Lord and gave her life to this church when she could just say I need to focus on me I didn't tell these people I was going to do this today and Karen Hubbard who lost her husband who had cancer, and now you're figuring out how you can open your home to children that don't have a home? Those are people that serve other people, that live their lives to make others glad in God. And I want that. So I'm not going to make anybody do anything, but you are missing out on the joy of service to our Lord when you just say, my existence is just to make myself glad. The band can, praise team can come up, worship team, whatever we call them, I don't know. Um, Justin and friends. 
I, 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 uh, I'm really thankful for Crosspoint, um, the Methodist church up the, up the hill, as you call it if you're from here. Um, they, they have a basketball league. For Our city doesn't have a basketball league, and they do a basketball league, and they do a great job with it. And so, you know, my kids, I wanted them to be involved in that, and so I coach because, uh, I, you know, I, I want to help out however I can. And, um, and this past week, and, and we have a little devotional, and I usually don't follow the devotional fully because I just take the Bible verses. I'm a preacher. That's just kind of... Uh, what I want to do. So anyway, uh, the verse this week was Romans 10, 9, and so I wrote it on the board, and Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so I, I asked the kids, I said, you know, what, what am I on the court? You know, and, and um, there's this assistant coach with me, and they eventually got to the fact that I was, you know, coach. And I said, so like, am I the master of you? And some of them, because I'll hard on them, were like, yes. But <laughs> I'm like, well, this is church league basketball, so maybe I'm taking it a little too seriously. But um, no, I'm really not. I'm your coach. But this word Lord that Jesus is, and we got to the definition of it, it was, it was a Lord who a king had given authority to rule over a dominion, part of his dominion, in an area, and he had full authority because it came from the king. And we understand that Jesus has full authority from the king because he and the king are one. And so when he is the Lord, he has supreme rule. And so to, to believe in him, to live for him, to be a Christian, we really have to believe he has the supreme rule, the authority in our lives. But I said to the kids on my team, you know, both my teams, one of my sons are on them, and um, Dennis uh, Ely and uh, Richard Allen, who are both members of our church, they have kids on the teams that I coach. And I said, what's it like to have your dad as the coach? And I was kind of scared of that answer, actually, for a moment. But like, is it good? And they all said, yeah. Why is it good? Now, ultimately, the reason that it's good is because you know that your coach may have a lot of rules and a lot of things they want you to do, but they're for you. And I think when you hear what we're talking about today, there's this temptation to think, oh, you're against me. You don't want what's for me. God, you, you want to be Lord and you want to have rule over my life. Yes, he does, but he's for you. So he has complete authority, but everything he's telling you to do is because he's for you. And when you believe that he's Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, understanding he died for you and he's resurrected and he's promised you resurrection, that's salvation and that's what we live for and what a joyful thing we're invited into by the one true living God. Let's pray together. Father, you said that you came so that we have, may have joy and our, may, our joy may be complete. And God, may our joy not be tied to our circumstances, but may our joy be tied to you and the hope we have in the cross and the resurrection. And God, may that fuel us to live our lives, not to make ourselves glad, but to, to out of the overflow of love we have for you, to serve others and to see you at work in our lives in a way that only you can be at work. God, may we have open hearts for how you would apply this in our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.